All right, so like I said, today's class is on companion planting. Um, and my name is Becca, so please feel free to chat in those questions throughout our workshop today. Um, so if you likely already have an idea of what companion planting is, if you are here today, um, but today we're going to be talking um, a little bit more in depth about companion planting maybe than you've discussed it before. Um, typically when we think about companion planting, we look up a chart um, and it'll tell us what plants to plant next to each other or which ones to avoid. Um, and that is a, a big part of companion planting. Um, but today we're going to talk a little bit beyond that as well um, as far as how we're going to arrange our plants in our garden to get the best results possible. How can the plants that we choose to put next to each other um, improve our harvest, um, maybe reduce the number of pests, um, lots of different things that we can do um, in our garden planning to help come, come out with some better results in our garden. Um, so some different benefits of companion planting that we're going to discuss today, um, the benefits of providing a little extra shade in your garden, maybe um, providing some nutrients that are complementary to each other between plants, um, make more efficient use of our garden space that we have, especially if you have a small garden, you want to make the most of the space that you can, or maybe you're just working on getting more out of the garden space that you do have. Um, we may want to reduce the amount of garden maintenance that we have to do. That's always helpful. Um, and companion planting can also play a big role in attracting good bugs or getting rid of the bad bugs. Um, so there's lots of different ways to use companion planting um, beyond what we might um, usually think about. Um, so companion planting can really just take full advantage of the different ways that plants interact with each other. And our goal here is to be very intentional with the way that we put our plants together. Um, so how do we know which um, plants do well next to each other? Um, honestly, a lot of it is trial and error. Um, throughout the history of people growing plants, they've noticed when, um, you know, one plant does a whole lot better because it's plants, it's next to something else versus if it was in a different spot and didn't do very well um, within the same year. So lots of observation, trial and error, um, making good notes in your garden or great observations, taking lots of good pictures. And there's also a lot of science behind it. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything is going to work the same in your space that it does in someone else's. Um, we've got folks from all over the world today. Um, and so plants are going to work, interact differently with each other, depending on what pests you have, what kind of soil you have. Um, so just because a companion planting guide says that it's going to work doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in your space. And just because it says that two plants really don't like to be planted next to each other, doesn't mean it's not going to work either. Um, so there's a lot of different information out there. So if you just Googled companion planting guide, you will come up with a lot of conflicting information. Um, and I think that's okay. That, that gives us some options to work with. And while it's not a solid answer, um, not a whole lot in gardening is. So um, a lot of it's trial and error, but hopefully we can get you set in the right direction so that you're not having to do all the trial and error yourself. Okay, so especially in an organic garden or using organic gardening methods, um, companion planting can be a fabulous tool to help um, reach some certain goals that we might want to do in an organic garden versus if you're um, doing more of a traditional method. Um, so companion planting can help to eliminate some of the need for some of those um, pesticides and herbicides that we may need to use from time to time. Um, because even organic options can have some negative side effects on some of our favorite beneficial insects. Um, so if we're using the plants themselves, um, instead, perhaps we're having to do less of that um, use of products in our garden. Um, we can also help save time time on maintenance in the garden, which can be huge in an organic garden. Um, if you're not using um, herbicides, you may have a lot more um, weed pulling to do. And so if we can reduce that time, you can spend more time canning and planting more and seed starting and doing all those other fun things that we want to do more of. 
Um, and also companions can help add different nutrients to the soil and organic matter to the soil um, that you may be relying on if you're not using um, synthetic fertilizers. So it can be a really great boost in an organic gardening system. Um, and companion planting helps us um, create this whole ecosystem in our garden. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do to help have a successful garden is helping the vegetable, herb, and fruit crops grow within a system rather than trying to protect them from the system that they naturally grow in. Um, we want everything to work together well. And so if we can continue to um, think in, in, um, intentionally about what we're planting next to each other and what we're including in our garden space, we can have a more successful system rather than just successful individual crops or plants. We've got a comment already that um, basil and tomatoes grow very well together. That's a very uh, common companion plant. And yes, it has been um, shown that they do grow well together, increase, um, improve flavor, um, help with pests, all sorts of different things. Wonderful example to start us out with. Um, so some of the strategies that we'll discuss today as we're going through the different benefits of companion planting um, that you may use um, to implement your, your companion planting will be complementary planting, cover crops, nutrition planting, succession planting, and square foot gardening. So you may already do some of these things, maybe just naturally in your garden, especially if you have a small garden space, you may be forced to do a little companion planting. Um, but we'll discuss some of these, we'll discuss these today as we go through the slides. Um, and sometimes they work well alone. Sometimes you may use several strategies in the same place. Okay, so how to implement our companion planting. Um, this picture here on the slide is uh, from our learning garden. You can see here in North Texas, we're transitioning from our warm weather crops into our cool weather crops. Um, our seasons are very fluid here. Um, we don't have a whole lot of uh, fall. So we go with a warm season and cool season. Um, and here we've got our okras just finishing out for the year and we've got our broccoli plants tucked alongside them. So we'll discuss that system a little bit more here as well. So if you remember the first benefit that I mentioned um, is that companion planting or intentional planting um, can help provide shade or season extension for some other crops in your garden. Um, here in North Texas, we talk a lot about the heat because we do consistently get over 100 degrees in the summer for usually a couple of months. And so the heat is usually our our, our toughest nemesis, um, but in your area, it may be the, the cold weather that you're trying to protect some other plants from. Um, so we'll discuss that as well, um, because that does happen here, especially if you're, you know, you have a late frost um, in the spring and you've already got your tomatoes in. Um, how can you kind of protect those plants um, before the, the frost is there? Um, so we'll start with the heat. Um, protecting plants from the heat. Um, in, I've got on this list here. If you think about plants that love heat, so our tall heat tolerant crops, um, okra is a great example here in Texas, um, but also some of our trellised vining plants that happen to love the heat. Using those plants to create shade for some of your crops that don't like the heat as much. Um, here we can grow lots of um, bush beans and cucumbers, but not for the whole year. But if you were able to provide them with a little bit of shade from your okra or your sunflowers or some sort of trellised plant, um, then you could maybe extend the amount of time in which your beans and your cucumbers are able to produce. So strategically planting those in an area, um, perhaps with your bush beans on the east side and your okra on the west side to block your afternoon sun, you can get a little more production out of your bush beans. Um, same with some of your cool season crops, kind of like I mentioned earlier, we had our okra and our broccoli right next to each other. So um, okra will produce here until it freezes. So maybe mid-November, maybe longer, maybe shorter. It kind of depends on the year, but mid-November is about average. 
And mid-November is a little late to be planting broccoli. We can plant broccoli in September here, um, but to protect it from the heat, we could plant it right up next to that okra and provide it with some shade and protection from the heat until um, we're ready to chop that okra out of the ground. And that gives us a little bit of a, a longer growing season for our broccoli. So I've got some pictures here on the next page. Um, and if you have any favorite plants that you plant together to protect from either the cold or the heat, feel free to pop those in the chat box. I'd especially be interested to um, learn about some other examples on the colder side of things because we don't deal with that as much here in Texas. Um, so here's some great examples. Um, on the left there, you've got the okra again with our mustard growing right up next to it. And this is one of the favorite, my favorite things that I learned from one of my coworkers. Um, you know, you, well, you might think, okay, so if I plant that mustard right there, I'm gonna have to take that okra out eventually. How is that gonna work? Um, and so what, what we do at our garden, and it doesn't always work out very well this way, um, but we will chop the okra off right at the soil level rather than yanking it out of the ground so that we don't disturb the mustard and then we're able to get the okra out of the way. And then that root ball from the okra will most of the time um, break back down and contribute organic matter to the soil. So that's a great method to do with your tomatoes, your peppers, your okra, your eggplant, those larger crops that instead of yanking out of the ground and pulling all that soil and organic matter with you, um, with it, you could just chop it off right at the soil level and let that break back down into the soil and contribute back to it. And then going um, to the right here, that top picture, um, this is a pretty common method, a way of growing um, cucumbers. Cucumbers can be fairly um, heat sensitive. And so growing them in a way that the cucumbers kind of hang below the shade of their leaves can help a little bit with um, reducing the bitterness that can come from um, cucumbers exposed to too much sunlight. They are also there then providing some shade for those cabbages or lettuce that look like they're finishing out for the year. Um, so that's a great way to do it too. If you got your cabbage in a little bit late and it's starting to get really hot, grow one of your warm season crops um, to provide some shade and protection from the heat while that cabbage finishes up. So this middle picture at the bottom here is a tomato seedling amongst some lettuce, which I thought was a great idea. Um, so here in North Texas, we can plant our tomatoes about mid-March, um, but that leaves us a little bit vulnerable to a potential frost. So why not plant it amongst some other established cool season crops to help protect it, insulate it, maybe block it from the wind a little bit. Um, you may still have to cover it, but it's going to protect from that cool weather um, until the tomato is big enough to take care of itself. All right, and then this picture on the right is actually from my home garden. Um, something I tried this year is I've got my pole beans on that cattle panel there. And in front of it, I have some brassicas. I think it's kohlrabi and um, cauliflower. And this was earlier in the year. I was trying to get my brassicas in early and I wanted to protect them from the heat. So the beans actually block the afternoon sun from those brassicas, those coal crops. Um, so an example I was trying and it's working out fairly well so far. Um, the beans are about finished now and they've, they're they gonna kind of kick the bucket here as soon as we get some cold weather. Um, so then I'll be ready to take those out and add something else in along that trellis line. So just an example of how to um, strategically put your plants together to help um, increase the amount of production or amount of time they might have in the garden. All right, so next we can use our plants to help provide nutrients for each other. The most obvious way to do this is with nitrogen fixing crops, um, legumes and other crops that will help add nitrogen back to the soil. You can plant them um, right next to in the growing season to a crop that needs more nitrogen or plant them um, in between seasons um, or in succession. So it doesn't necessarily have to be planted at the same exact time to um, provide benefit to each other. For example, um, I might grow tomatoes in the summer and then for my winter crop in that same spot, I would put, um, maybe I'll grow some snap peas or fava beans 
to help replenish the nitrogen that the tomatoes took from that soil. Um, so thinking about that when you're planting your crop rotation um, or even when you're planting right next to each other. So one common um, companion that is more of a traditionally thought of companion would be growing corn with pole beans. The corn can support the pole beans and the pole beans help provide more nitrogen back to the soil. I will provide one caveat here at the bottom is that um, beans tend to be a little finicky and have some negative impacts on some different crops. So you might want to um, double check those resources. I have to look it up every time before I plant my beans. Um, it seems to be different between bush beans and pole beans um, and they do interact negatively with some different crops. One of them being kohlrabi, which is what was planted in my, my example on the last page, and they seem to be doing fine. So maybe that's one of those things where um, they're planted far, just far enough away, or maybe it works in my space for some reason and not others. Um, I will say as we're discussing things today, if you have a question about a specific um, crop and how it interacts with others, I do have my um, Carrots Love Tomatoes book with me here if we need to um, look up some specific examples. Um, and I do have this referenced on another slide here if you would like to take a look at that later. Um, you could get your own copy. It's a wonderful book. Um, but like I said, it's hard to remember all of the interactions of all the different plants and so having a reference guide is great. So here's some examples of our nitrogen fixing plants. Um, I'll go on the top first or top left are some beautiful little um, snap peas that are growing in our learning garden. They've got them um, growing up against a trellis there and there will likely be something growing underneath them. Um, that will help provide nutrients back to the soil and it's a wonderful crop as well. Strawberries and snap peas happen to be a great companion. You can see that in the second in the upper right picture. Um, strawberries grow low and they sprawl, whereas the snap peas grow up um, and they also will provide some protection and some nutrients to those strawberries, especially if it's um, getting to be fairly cool weather. On the bottom, we have on the bottom left is some crimson clover, a wonderful cover crop. If you've not tried cover crops yet and you're ready for some experimentation in your garden, cover crops are um, a wonderful way to add nutrients back to the soil in between growing seasons. Um, and I've got a slide a little bit later that will talk about cover crops in depth a little bit more. Um, they're also beautiful, so check those out. And then that middle bottom picture, we have corn growing with some beans, a wonderful traditional companion. And bottom right are fava beans. Um, and maybe y'all can chime in and let me know who else grows fava beans. But I learned about fava beans about three or four years ago when we had an unusually cold winter here in North Texas. We had a day that started out as some, at 75 degrees Fahrenheit it went down to, I think it was 25, maybe it was under 20. We don't get under 20 degrees Fahrenheit here very often. So it was a very um, big surprise for us, especially that big of a drop in one day. And um, was looking online on the different Facebook groups for, for um, gardeners and everyone was saying, oh, my crops, they just, it didn't matter what I covered them with. It was, it was just such a terrible loss. And then I saw these beautiful um, fava beans that were unscathed. Um, they did not cover them. They're very hardy. They're very cold hardy. They add nitrogen um, back to the soil. Um, just a comment came in that they have an edible flower. They have an edible pod um, and they're just amazing to look at. So um, they might, some people call them broad beans, fava beans or broad beans, um, wonderful crop. So if you don't typically grow anything in the winter here in North Texas, um, throw some fava beans in your raised beds um, and you will have a wonderful crop that um, will add some nutrients back to your soil. I'm glad to hear that other people grow them as well. Um, I love them. I'm so glad that we discovered them. And if you can't find the seeds, just go to the grocery store and get a bag of fava beans and likely most of them will sprout if you plant them. Um, so give those a try. They're beautiful, huge plants and produce lovely, delicious beans. Thank you for the comments on that. That's wonderful. Glad to know other people have discovered them as well. Okay, so another benefit of uh, companion planting is um, that we can make better use of our space. 
collection space can sometimes be very limited. Or if you have one of those ever expanding gardens, um, you may just want to get more and more and more out of your um, your garden space. So square foot gardening is a very, very popular method for backyard gardeners, especially um, beginning backyard gardeners, because it helps give um, very um, intentional directions on how to plant how much in a square foot amount of space, and you can get a lot from it. It's a very compact way of growing. Um, it's not for everybody, but it's a good um, guideline. If you haven't um, done much with square foot gardening, you may look that up and, and see how much more you might be able to get out of your garden than you are now. Um, so square foot garden usually um, works with the horizontal space. But I'd like us to also think about the vertical space we have in our garden and the root space that we use as well. How much space is each plant taking up and um, could we put them together in a more strategic fashion that we're able to get more out of our space? Um, so the first thing we'll think of is the horizontal versus vertical space. So some of our plants, of course, grow taller and skinnier, thinking of corn, maybe sunflowers. Um, that could support something that climbs. So things like our pole beans, our cucumbers, um, maybe some small squash or melons and give an opportunity for that climber to really climb on something natural. You could also, of course, provide a trellis or something for your um, vining plants to climb on that would also leave extra space on the ground for something else. And typically things that climb want to climb and they will produce better if you allow them some support. Um, for sprawlers, if we wanna think about what can grow in that horizontal space, we can think about our um, zucchinis, our melons, our pumpkins, um, and maybe pairing those sprawlers with a climber. So you have something taking up a lot of vertical space as well as using that um, horizontal space as well. And then some smaller sprawlers are or oregano and strawberries. They don't take up a whole lot of space, but they will spread and they will cover. Um, so thinking about not only our horizontal space, but our vertical space, and then also our root space. Um, so trying to pair plants together that will um, not all just take up all of the root space. So not necessarily putting our tomatoes and our okra and our watermelons all in the same bed. Um, maybe mix in some things that have more shallow roots. Um, like beans and tomatoes are a great pair. Um, they take up different amount of root space. So you've got your tomatoes that are really going deep down into the soil and other things that are staying more shallow. So they're not competing for the same nutrients at the same soil level. Um, so just keeping that in mind, and again, I'll send this out um, after the um, class, likely on Monday, and this is in your handout also, but just keeping these things in mind when you're planning. Um, it's not just what's above the ground, it's think about what's below the ground as well. And of course your um, root vegetables like onions, garlic, beets, carrots, um, you're, wanna go, you're going to want to plant them next to something that doesn't compete for that same amount of root space. You wanna give them the room to grow um, and expand under the soil. If, okay, so we have a question. If watermelon is a deep rooted um, plant, is it safe to grow in a container? I would say likely yes. You would need to have um, a fairly large container. You can see here, um, it's going to take up quite a, it's going to need quite a bit of space. Or just know that if you plant it in um, a smaller container than what it would ideally prefer, you may get less production out of it. I think generally a watermelon is going to prefer to be in the ground, um, but it can grow in a container. I mean, tomatoes do great in containers, um, as do peppers, which are not quite as deeply rooted. Um, but you're going to want to make sure you have a fairly large amount of soil space for it. So just keep that in, in mind um, and know that if you give it less than what it prefers, it'll it'll give you less than what you prefer perhaps. Um, so just knowing um, that you, it may need a little more supplementation. Um, so you have a sugar baby watermelon. It, it may be, um, are you in North Texas or Texas area? Um, it, if you are, it's likely too late to repot it now or plant it in the ground now because it's going to get cold here soon. Um, so 
maybe just for next year, try doing it in a, a larger space or maybe find, um, see if you can look on some seed catalogs and find a watermelon um, that is maybe a patio variety or, um, or smaller. Sugar baby is pretty small, um, so you may be okay. Um, and yes, the cold did hit today. <laughs> it was very cold this morning. Um, so we're, we're, but that may also be a benefit that you could bring that inside and um, it's, it will likely warm up again. So um, kind of a, a positive negative situation there that um, it is a smaller variety of water, watermelon, um, but likely it would prefer a little bit more space. Okay, so here's some great examples of using the um, horizontal, vertical, and root space wisely. Um, here on the left, we've got some great Malabar spinach, which is on a trellis growing vertically um, and actually growing on the back side um, of a raised bed. So it, we can harvest from the front and the back. Um, otherwise, it would just be sprawling on the ground and taking up space that it didn't necessarily need. And then a great um, combination, companion planting lettuce and onion there in the middle on the top. Um, they take up different amounts of root space and it also is very visually appealing, which may be what you are looking for in your garden. Um, the lettuce stays nice and tidy and it kind of opens up a little bit, whereas your onions um, are going to grow nice and tall in between. Um, so those would be great companions. And likely the lettuce will be ready sooner than the onions and so you'll be able to harvest that and perhaps get it out of the way so the onions can spread out a little bit more also. Uh, the top right is a um, three sisters garden. Uh, it is a combination of corn, beans, and some sort of squash. Um, squash or pumpkin is typically used. And so there you've got the support of the corn. The beans are um, not only being able to climb on the corn, but they're providing nitrogen. And then you have your sprawler, your um, squash that is um, going out and beyond the edges of the raised bed. Um, that's a, a good um, method for watermelons as well. If you wanna plant them in perhaps the corner or the outside edge of a raised bed, it can then continue outside um, of the raised bed and not take up space in your garden bed. Um, we did have a question in the chat box and if somebody knows the answer, feel free to um, respond. Um, I have some ideas, but I don't know for sure. Um, the question is, does anyone know if onions repel squirrels? So the general answer is typically um, things that smell good to us, like onions and garlic that are very strong smelling, um, our pests and our critters don't like as much um, as, and herbs and things like that. But I will tell you that every time I try to plant onions, squirrels dig them up several different times. Um, <laughs> somebody responded that nothing repels a hungry squirrel. I, <laughs> I am fighting them terribly right now. That I think that's why my root vegetables never do well. I typically have a squirrel come and dig up half the seeds that I plant. So um, I've resorted to putting some wire fencing over the area that I plant my seeds until they germinate enough to be um, not impacted as much by a digging squirrel. Um, but in general, other pests um, are typically repelled by those very smelly things that we tend to like. Um, so usually it's a very good pest deterrent. Um, question came, what are the two plants on the top right? So there's three plants in the top right, um, corn, uh, beans, and squash. I'm not sure what kind of squash it is. Um, so the squash are the big leaves with the bright yellow flowers. The beans are kind of amongst those with the teardrop shaped leaves. And then we've got tall corn there in the middle. Ooh, landscape fabric over the onions was a suggestion to keep the squirrels from, from digging them up. That's a great idea. I like that too. So typically some sort of physical barrier is what's going to repel squirrels um, is really the answer a fence or landscape fabric or netting, something like that. Um, on the bottom in the middle, we've got peas growing up on a trellis. It looks like some sort of green, maybe mustard going along the sides. And then they even have some marigolds along the front here to um, work on some pest control. And then the bottom right is a good example of square foot gardening where they've actually outlined um, the square foot section so they know what they're planting. 
And then we had another question. What was the first picture? This picture on the far left is called Malabar spinach. Um, I don't know where all it grows in the world, but in um, Texas, it is a great thing to grow in the summer. Typically we grow all of our lettuces and our greens and our spinaches in the cool weather, but this Malabar spinach loves the heat. Um, and you can see the little white dots on it. Those will turn into um, little berry looking things that will drop and it'll reseed itself for the next year. It is very prolific. Um, it can take over. It's easy to pull out though. It doesn't, it's not enough to um, take over a space completely. Um, and it tastes like spinach. It's a little bit of a thicker leaf, um, but it's very good. You could cook it up in um, omelets, put in your smoothies, freeze it. It's, um, it's wonderful. Um, it's a really great warm season green and it, and it loves the heat. It'll, it'll be fine if it's hundred degrees. Um, there's a comment that it's also grown in the San Diego area. So that's good to know. Good to know. Wonderful crop. You can usually find little seedlings of it at local nurseries. Um, I wouldn't think the big box stores would have it. Um, but if you know anyone who's grown it before, they will likely have several seedlings come up the next year. All right, next we've got um, ways we can use um, companion planting to reduce garden maintenance. So whether that is um, preventing weeds from growing or deterring weeds from growing, along with deterring pests, which is um, usually a, a, a big benefit of companion planting and something folks wanna know about. Um, if we can use our planting style and our plan to help reduce the work we have to do in the garden. That is just more time for us to do all the other fun things we want to do with our garden as well. Um, so I promised we'd talk more about cover crops and here we are. Um, so cover crops, if you're not familiar, um, is basically a placeholder. It's a placeholder crop that will benefit the place you're growing it in, but you're not necessarily growing it for a harvest. Um, in the case of fava beans, they are a great cover crop and a great harvest, but most of these other things, you typically just grow them as a placeholder. So um, here in Texas, our cool season cover crops are listed there on the left, grasses, some clover, um, the fava beans, and then some things we can grow when it's warmer, buckwheat, crimson clover also falls into the warm season. Um, and typically you can buy um, big bags of the seed at feed stores, um, tractor supply, something like that, um, because it's used in um, on fields that are used for grazing, typically, and you plant it in larger amounts. Um, but it's also great if you've got, um, let's say you just built a new planting area or you're planning to plant um, in the spring, but you want to um, add some nutrients, you want to add some organic matter, you want to reduce the amount of weeds in a certain area, you can overseed a cover crop and then let it grow. When you're ready to do your planting, you either cut it back or you till it under and let it die there. So it, so the, um, the dead plants add your organic matter. Um, they may add some nutrients. Um, also, you've likely blocked out any weeds that would try to grow if you seeded it thickly enough. Um, so an example of that is that upper left-hand corner. Um, that was an area we were planning to grow in and I seeded that very thick. It looked like lush green grass all winter. It was fabulous um, and it kept out all the weeds while we weren't ready to grow there yet. We wanted to build the bed. We wanted to add some nutrients and so we seeded that cover crop. Um, it was likely a pea and oat blend. Um, didn't have enough room for the peas to come up because I let the oats go too thickly but um, there it is looking really nice and it's just a placeholder. I didn't harvest anything from it. Um, what we got was soil improvement from the cover crops. So fun idea, not always applicable in a um, backyard setting, but for a new bed, like if you're thinking about creating a new flower bed and you wanna um, block out all the grass, um, try overseeding it with a cover crop to kind of have that stuff grow up. Um, until you're ready to plant. Typically it'd take, you wanna have several months, I would say four to six months before your planting is when you wanna do the cover crop. And then some other things that can help block out the weeds. Um, I'll get to your question in just a second. Um, 
uh, some things you can do to block out the weeds are planting those other sprawling um, perennials. So like strawberries on the bottom left here in Texas, they're a perennial. Um, and then upper right hand corner is thyme. So um, having those in even landscaping beds um, to help block out the weeds, they kind of take up the whole the whole surface area. And then some of our annuals that can help block out weeds are those big leafed plants like our watermelon, our um, squash, uh, sweet potato vines that are gonna cover an area and typically will reduce the number of weeds that come up through it. Um, Bermuda grasses is, is pretty resilient and will likely come up through all of that, um, but it can help reduce the amount of maintenance you're doing. So we did get a question, um, can we plant lavender in Texas soil outside for the whole year? Yes, you will likely need to amend your soil just a little bit. Um, it prefers a little bit more of a sandy soil. So depending on where you are um, in Texas, I know if you're in Tarrant County and Fort Worth area, you likely have clay soil. Try to mix in some green sand and a little bit of um, organic matter, like a little bit of compost. It doesn't have to be a very high quality compost. Um, lavender does not require super nutrient rich soil. Um, it doesn't need a whole lot of watering. That's um, typically where folks run into troubles, they water it too much. Um, so if you've got to find an area that's a little bit protected, um, it's not like rosemary, it's not tough like rosemary. Um, it mostly just wants to be ignored and have a nice quiet place to live. <laughs> so if you give it a little bit of a sandy soil, a um, little bit of organic matter, water it every once in a while, it'll do great. It took me a few tries to find the right spot in my yard, um, but I have a spot near my compost pile that's kind of in a corner, um, kind of protected, and it's it's the best that I've ever had lavender do. So it is possible. Um, it just, it kind of needs a specific setting and then you kind of leave it alone. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, sun or shade, it would need, um, if you can give it a little bit of shade during the day, I wouldn't do full shade. Um, I would say at least six hours of sun. Um, and if you can put it in a spot where it gets a little bit of shade, that's great, but it can handle, it can handle some hot sun might just struggle a little bit more if it's if it's full, full hot sun. Okay, so pest control is typically what folks wanna know a whole lot about with companion planting. And I'm not gonna go into any specific um, bug. I can answer some questions, of course, about specific bugs if you'll have them, but I'm not gonna cover them explicitly here because in general, what we wanna do is we want to create that ecosystem I was talking about. We want a garden that invites our pollinators, invites our ladybugs, invites our wasps even to help control these bad bug populations um, so that we don't have to use pesticides. Um, we may need to also have a little bit of patience as well um, while those populations are getting established. Um, and so I've got a list here of common North Texas pests, which I'm sure um, some of y'all have different things that you are battling throughout the year. Um, but these are common ones that we see throughout the different seasons. So aphids tend to be spring and fall. Cabbage loopers are gonna join us when we've got our, um, our cabbages and broccolis and cauliflowers out. And then of course we get our squash bugs and hornworms in the summer. Um, but these are pretty common and they are gonna be here no matter what. So we can try to plant things that attract their predators. Um, and we can also help deter them from our favorite crops, like with basil, those really smelly good things that we like, a lot of these bugs may not like. And we did have a question come in. Okay, so to help balance the garden maintenance, when do you bring in and harvest things like herbs, tomatoes, etc.? Um, first time gardener and may need to do the winter seeding you spoke about. So to help balance garden maintenance, when do we bring things in and harvest? Um, you may need to clarify your question a little bit. Um, so we harvest throughout the year and um, typically a lot of our herbs are going to be perennials. There's a few perennials being things that grow all year round. Um, there are a few exceptions here in, in North Texas. Um, basil typically only grows in warm weather. 
Cilantro, parsley, and dill typically only grow in cool weather. However, there are things that grow year round like thyme, sage, oregano, mint, um, rue, and oh gosh, there's so many others, germander, rosemary, lavender. And so if there are things that are always going to be established in your garden, you may want to put them outside your, your annual garden planting beds, um, but you can kind of harvest those as you need them. Otherwise, they're going to kind of hang out and do the work they need to do in the garden. Um, for those annuals, you can kind of harvest them throughout the season. You never want to pull the whole thing out. It's kind of a harvest as you go type of thing. And then um, that'll help leave those plants around um, to protect some of those other plants. So if you have a basil right next to a tomato, harvest a few leaves of basil when you need it so it can continue to grow and flourish and protect your tomato plant. I hope that helps. If that doesn't, please um, feel free to add a follow-up question. I'll see what else I can do for you. Okay, so along with our um, bad bugs in Texas, we've got some good ones. Um, we want to continue to think about that ecosystem as we don't want to protect our plants from all the bugs. We want the good bugs. And so sometimes we need to have a few bad bugs in our garden to, um, to provide food for these good critters that we want to have come along. Um, so you will likely see lots of ladybugs in your, in your garden if it's a nice healthy garden. Um, I did label them North Texas beneficials because I have spiders and birds on there as well. Um, they help control a lot of our bad bug population. Wasps are also a great pollinator and I know they can be scary sometimes, but they are a great um, bug to have in the garden. So as long as it's not in an area that, um, you know, as long as they're not harming anyone, if they're staying out of the way, um, they're not aggressive, um, I would say let those wasps live and take care of um, some pollinating for you and help get rid of some bad bugs. Um, but we want to try to attract both. So if you see something that you think is harming your plant, perhaps aphids. Aphids will happen a lot um, when we're starting to change seasons. Um, wait around just a minute to it, unless they're completely covering your plant, give them a few minutes for the ladybugs to come around and start eating them. They may do that controlling for you. Um, and we had a comment about wasps. Yes, they do pollinate right alongside the bees. I'm trying to be a good advocate for wasps. Yes, yellow jackets can be really scary and aggressive and wasp stings do hurt, but typically if you're not um, you know, messing with their home, um, they're not going to hurt you and they are great pollinators. So when we, when we do need some help in a time where we may not have as many bees around as we want, we wanna have those good wasps um, come and help us out. So some of the more docile ones like your paper wasp, um, the ones with the reddish body. Um, there's even some really small ones like the parasitic wasps that um, they likely almost look like flies and they will come and take care of some of our big caterpillars that will chomp away at our um, tomatoes. So they really can be helpful and beneficial. So um, I would say if it's not in an area that is um, harmful or, you know, in the way that somebody might stick their hand right into it and, and um, often, then go ahead and, and let those wasps be for a little bit. Um, so to attract and deter, these plants on this list here, um, help attract and deter several different things. So um, if you plant some oregano in your garden, that may ward off a variety of different bad bugs and may attract a lot of different good bugs. So in general, you wanna plant a lot of variety in your garden. Um, a lot of these herbs that are listed are some of those perennial ones that will live in your garden throughout the year. And there's also some that are annuals. And so focusing on some of these smellier plants, we like the smell of them, even if you're not gonna use them um, in the kitchen, maybe adding some of these smelly herbs to help attract good bugs, letting them flower so that they attract bees and some other um, good pollinators. And um, then also just thinking about to include these maybe rather than some of your traditional landscaping plants um, will help get some more bugs into your garden. And we have a question that came in. How can we attract bees to make a nest in, um, in a beehive or a bamboo artificial one? Um, 
So there's several different types of bees and I am not a bee expert by any means, um, but the, the um, bug hotels you can buy that have the bamboo pieces in it, um, those are a different type of bee than our honeybees and they don't typically live in um, a, a colony like you would think of traditionally as a bee. Um, so there's lots of different kinds of bees. Some bees grow in the ground, um, some um, like little holes. I've seen them go into, I have bamboo that I use as trellising and I've seen them crawl right in there. Um, so I think to attract um, bees in general, um, likely there are some nearby that have a home. Maybe you have a beekeeper in your neighborhood um, that you may not be aware of. Um, and these bees can travel up to several miles to come pollinate your plants. Um, having plants that they want to, um, that they, they want to visit. Um, things with lots of flowers, small flowers, different sizes of flowers. Um, and having things that flower throughout the year will attract lots of bees. In order to attract them to live in your space, I think a bug hotel is a great idea. Um, you can even get um, a, a bunch, make a small bunch of bamboo, maybe cut it into a small piece and put some string around it, hang it from a tree in a protected area. Um, they might like that. Um, they need water system. I was commenting here um, of great ways to attract bees. Thank you so much for those suggestions. Um, but to have a hive that would need more maintenance. We just had a meeting at our at our garden to discuss if we wanted to have a hive on the property where we have a couple different community gardens. Um, and the the gentleman was telling us that he lives in the neighborhood and he has several hives. And so likely his bees are already pollinating our gardens. And so it may not be more beneficial for us to have a hive right on site when the bees are already visiting us. So um, it could be helpful, but I think um, like the comments um, are coming in or, you know, have lots of different flowering plants, a water source, um, bird baths are great, and just having, attracting them with the plants that you're planting. And then we have a comment that came in, if you want to attract bees, stay away from red funnel shaped flowers. Okay. Good to know. And if to me, that sounds like something that might attract a hummingbird. Um, and maybe SJ, you can um, comment on that as well, because I feel like hummingbirds are something I know I want to have in my garden also. Um, so this list of plants is on your handout as well. So just things to keep in mind, um, things to keep an eye out for if you're perusing the, the garden nursery. Um, Borage is a great plant. Tansy, I love tansy. Tansy and yarrow are two of my favorite flowers um, that grow here pretty much year round and have great tiny flowers that our, our pollinators love. And then just throwing in some herbs here and there if you have the space for it. And if you can let them go to flower rather than pulling them out when they're done for the end of the season, um, let them flower, let them go to seed, collect that seed, especially dill. Um, is, is a wonderful um, thing to be able to use in the kitchen and also those flowers will attract more pollinators. Okay, and then here's a few more at the bottom. I've got a couple pictures on this page that bought, the left picture is tansy. So if you've not grown tansy before, um, lovely little flower. It can get kind of tall and you gotta cut it back a couple times a year if you wanna maintain a, um, a tidier look. Um, I usually cut it back once maybe. Um, it does, however, it can irritate your skin. There's a sap in it. So be careful when you are cutting it back to maybe not do it in um, the hot sun of the day. The metal here is nasturtium. Um, that's great. I know it grows really well in more moderate climates. Um, and here in Texas, we can grow it kind of in the spring and in the fall. Um, so that's something you can add. It's got an edible flower to it as well. It makes a great companion to a lot of plants. So you can kind of tuck it in between things. Um, if you let it get established before everything else, though, it will, it will kind of take over for a little bit. Um, and then on the right is rue. And I have lots of rue planted in my garden, but I have never really figured out what to do with it. So if somebody knows what to do with rue, you'll have to let me know. Um, but it has a great flower. It produces a ton of seeds, so you can always reseed it. Um, and it um, is a perennial here in Texas. Some more pictures for you on the left is Turk's cap. Um, 
I want to say it's a Texas, na Texas native plant, um, and I didn't have it listed. Um, it's not edible by any means, but it does attract a lot of hummingbirds, which I love to see in the garden. And um, it's very tolerant of our heat here and terrible soil quality and low water. So um, Turks kept, and we got a yes, it is a Texas native plant. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we've got some mint there in the middle. Mint is always, I think that's mint looks a little different. Um, something similar to mint there. And anything in the mint family like lemon, lemon balm um, will tend to take over any place that you plant it in if you don't already know that. Um, so you may be careful about where you put it, but it's a great thing to have. I like to tuck it into my landscaping beds and my flower beds. Um, it has beautiful leaves, especially in the spring and fall here. And when it goes to flower, the bees are all over it. And then you can kind of use it as you'd like. Borage is on the upper right there, edible flower as well. Make sure to eat the whole thing because the, the sweet part is right in the middle. Bottom right is anise. Um, I have not successfully grown that here yet, but I am trying really hard. Um, and then in the bottom on the middle is yarrow, which it also comes in a nice yellow color and is fairly um, tolerant of our soil and our climate here as well. Great for our pollinators. And then of course, traditionally um, a good combination is marigolds and tomatoes as well. Marigolds are supposed to ward off several different pests that like to chomp on our tomatoes. Um, warm weather crop here, it will, um, I just took that picture the other day and felt very sad that it was gonna get cold soon because it's such a, a beautiful flower right now. Um, upper right, we have Mexican mint marigold, which is um, what we can grow here in Texas that tastes like tarragon. Um, but has beautiful flowers in the um, fall. Next to it, I believe, is some salvia, which is great as well, not edible. Bottom left is more mint. And then bottom right is um, a, a bunch of different herbs growing together there. Looks like some lamb's quarters, some thyme, sage. Looks like there's some kind of mint type of leaf shape in there as well, growing alongside some mustard also. And somebody commented that they have strawberry yarrow. That sounds beautiful. I love yarrow so much. Okay, so that's what I've got for y'all today. So think about if you've got some questions for me, if there's something that you really wish I would have covered and I didn't. Um, but I have taken up quite a bit of your time today um, and I appreciate you joining me. So just kind of conclusions here is that um, our garden doesn't happen in a bubble. Um, as much as we'd like to protect our plants from everything that could impact them, um, it'll be easier if we work with the systems that they grow in and, and help to improve our garden by working with those systems. Um, and I provided a lot of examples today. Um, don't don't try to do everything all at once. Keep it simple and, and try adding maybe one new element to your garden a year or a couple new elements um, throughout the year and see what works in your garden space. Make some observations. I like to take pictures. Um, it helps me remember what I've done from year to year and see the difference because I thought I had never grown melon before in my garden. I totally forgot that I had successfully grown cantaloupe. And then, you know, I saw a picture that, oh, five years ago I did grow melon. So keeping track for yourself um, and remembering that you have had success with different things. And then, um, you know, as you're keep learning, like you're doing today, learn from others, see what others' experiences are. Um, and I think that's usually the best way I learn is what has somebody else tried? What works for you in your specific area? Because um, I'm sure your space is like North Texas, where a weird little microclimate, it seems like hardly any other gardening book explains what we do here. And so learn from your neighbors and your friends. And if you're part of a community garden, chat with others about what they're growing throughout the year. Um, the book that I mentioned earlier is Carrots Love Tomatoes. It's um, a fairly well-established and well-known book on companion planting. It really provides some great insights um, about different crops, not just edible ones. It has some others in there also. Um, and then a couple others listed there, Vegetables Love Flowers and Companion Planting, which is a, a Rodale um, book um, that would be great as well. So like I said, there's a lot of information out there about companion planting and um, some of it's conflicting because it works differently in different places. So um, trial and error, but there are um, some um, well-known things out there like our basil and tomato, it's a great example. 
um, of things that do work well together. So if there's any questions, um, I would be happy to field those now. I know we've had some great questions throughout the day and I appreciate y'all um, chiming in. Um, as a reminder, I will send out an email um, on Monday with this PowerPoint slide with the handouts. Um, and if I come up with any other resources before then I'll send those out also. But I'm so glad y'all were here today. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. And hello from Las Vegas. Thank you for joining us. I'm hoping to get back out to see Las Vegas again soon, um, as soon as we can all go places, one of my favorite places to go. Um, so just as some other resources for y'all that I'll leave y'all with today, we do have a nice recipe library on our website. They just updated the website, so it's looking really fresh right now um, to use with your garden produce. We do have some um, garden-based recipes there. Um, if you are in our area, our 13 county, 13 county service area, and you are in need of food resources right now, please visit our website. We have a ton of resources out there right now. Um, visit our Facebook page. That's where we post a lot about our events and our different classes, as well as we've got recordings of our um, past classes on our YouTube page. Eventbrite is where you signed up today. Keep checking back for more classes. And if you're in our service area and want to volunteer, we do have volunteer opportunities right now at our gardens. And we would love to have you out. Um, they're really designed to teach along with um, doing what needs to be done in the garden. So you'll get some great hands-on experience. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, I see all the thanks you, thank yous coming in and I hope y'all have a wonderful weekend. And if you're in North Texas, enjoy this nice, cool, rainy weather that we're having. Um, question came in, if we have any recipes that include Tex-Mex, we do. Our recipe library, um, you can kind of search by entree and side dish, um, but we try to do things that, um, you know, reflect the culture of our area and the food resources that we have available. So I am certain and I, I can't think of one off the top of my head at the moment, um, but there are a ton of great recipes on there for some really simple and healthy um, Tex-Mex. So yes, definitely check that out, um, tafb.org slash recipes for all those great recipes. All right, thank y'all so much. Look, watch for that email coming from me on Monday and y'all have a wonderful, wonderful weekend um, and get some great gardening done. All right, thank you all, see you later.